have our regularly scheduled hearing on four bills. It looks like we have Senate Bill number 30, Senate Bill number 68, Senate Bill number 76, and Senate Bill number 134. These all deal with some type of a labor issue. So it's Labor Day in the committee. And we are going to go with this one first. Okay. We're looking for you. <laughs> Senator Doc Brown has prior commitments, so or, uh, we're going to ask him to come forward and present Senate Bill Number Thirty, dealing with prevailing wage. Then. We will hear 68 from Senator Parson, and then it is my intent to have 76 and 134 kind of presented at the same time, because they are very similar and deal with the same subject matter. Um, I, we, have, we have had over 300 witness forms turned in for today's hearing, which means lots of people want to have uh, their, their opinion recorded, so I will be limiting everyone's testimony to three minutes. You can get, you should be able to get your point across in, in, in three minutes, um, and so that'll be the time limit for for everyone. So that being said, Senator, start the hearing on Senate Bill 30. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and uh, I bring forward for your consideration today Senate Bill 30, and it deals with uh, uh, public contracts and prevailing wage law. Uh, I worked on this pretty hard, spent a lot of time on the last year and uh, trying to uh, go forward with something that seems to work a little better representing outstate Missouri. Uh, I don't think we ever denied the fact that current law seems to work well in San Luis County and Jackson County. In our area and a lot of outstate Missouri, it doesn't seem to work so well. So uh, what we did in Senate Bill 30, and I haven't uh, had any discussion yet from uh, folks that represent labor, we just went in and we took uh, the prevailing wage law out of state law. In other words, uh, hopefully we negotiate from this point and we come up with something that is doable for both sides. It also bars uh, project labor agreements on uh, public contracts. Uh, all public contracts it used to be 50% uh, or more. And, and you know, the reason I brought this forward is not something that I dreamed up or I ever had an issue in what I do for a living, uh, but this was originally brought to me by some of my county commissioners, and they were actually Democrats, and they were quite concerned about uh, prevailing wage law and how it was preventing them from uh, doing some, building some sheds and uh, also some of the repair work, a lot of uh, those issues have now uh, gone into the realm of prevailing wage law and was driving some what they considered maintenance costs up greatly. So, uh, you know, what I've presented is very simple. It doesn't, uh, it, it, there's not a lot of discussion on what the bill says. I'm sure there's a lot of discussion on how we get to a final uh, a point in the discussion. So with that, I will uh, take questions from the committee, or we'll start with witnesses, whatever you prefer. Are there any questions of the bill sponsor? Seeing none, Senator, you'd like to call your first witness? Yes, uh, they can just come. There's quite a few of them that would like to speak, and anyone that would like to speak in favor of the prevailing wage, uh, make your way forward. Just to remind everyone, if you do provide testimony, you need to fill out a witness form. There should be blank copies right here on the desk. You can take one with you and just turn them in uh, up here at the end. Um, if you've already turned the one in, you don't you don't need to do, do another one. Um, and remind you that uh, you have a three minute time limit, um, and I have a gavel and I have a timer. Welcome, Senator. Thank you very much. My name is Greg Colbrock. I'm a contractor in Missouri. I've been a contractor for 29 years in Missouri. I work throughout the Midwest and I do a lot of preventing wage work. A lot of you know I've been trying to reform prevailing wage, suggest reform prevailing wage for a lot of years. I've heard of now both sides argue that it needs to be reformed. I have very little cooperation on reform. So I'm here to support Doc Brown's testimony to uh, uh, position to repeal it. 
It will not hurt Kansas City and St. Louis in any way, shape, or form because any school district, any municipality can do similar to what the University of Missouri does and by contract demand for any way to be paid for any ways they want. So the school district in St. Louis or the city of St. Louis or the county of St. Louis that wants to do pay an equivalent of any ways they can do it by contract law similar to the University of Missouri or St. Mary's Hospital with the same thing here in Jefferson City. And to be short, okay, under my time limit, I would like to point out the effect that prevailing wage has, can have, and does have. Uh, we are the successful bidder on a project in Joplin, Missouri as a result of the tornado. Prevailing wage is in effect down there. We are the successful contractor. They will award us a contract in the amount of $370,000 under the prevailing wage laws in the state of Missouri. If there were not prevailing wage rate laws in the state of Missouri, my contract amount would have been $289,000, a savings of $81,000 to the school district of Joplin, Missouri, or 28%. Now, the reason this is important is this is the same company using the same employees. They're going to get the same quality. They're going to get the same safety. They're going to get exactly the same thing they would have gotten, except they're going to pay $81,000 more than they had. Very good. Any questions of this witness? Thank you very much for your testimony. But before I quit, before I call my next witness, how many people by show of hands want to testify in favor of this bill? Just so I have an idea of working through it. Okay, how many people would like to testify in opposition to this one? Okay. <clears throat> Sometimes when it's equal, I'll do one or the other, but since there's just a few more, uh, go ahead and call the next witness in support of Senate Bill 30. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, my name is Bruce Hillis. I'm from Mexico, Missouri. I'm a citizen, and primarily I'm a taxpayer in Missouri. And I appear on behalf of all taxpayers in Missouri. Today you're going to hear a, a lot from the proponents, and, I, and I'm and i here in support of uh, Senator Brown's bill. Today you're going to hear a lot uh, from proponents of uh, prevailing wage it's not going to be supported by scholarly studies, except perhaps those that they've uh, commissioned themselves. It'll talk about, you know, the, how cutthroat competition exists, perhaps, in, in the construction industry. They're going to talk about that it, prevailing wage presents uh, fair and competitive bidding, bidding, but there's no evidence to demonstrate that. They'll, they'll talk about how unskilled workers come to jobs if there's no prevailing wage. There's no evidence of that. The free market produces uh, ways to pr promote skilled workers just as well as any other uh, type of market. What the claims will all be will be with one thing in mind, to limit competition. To limit competition by the force of law to only those bidders that pay prevailing wage. You don't have to look at all the studies. There's lots of scholarly studies to show the cost change and what the taxpayers of this state will have to pay for under prevailing wage. I think you only have to rely on your own logic. People that love competition are buyers. People that hate competition are sellers. What the proponents of prevailing wage are selling is their wage rates. And I ask you not to buy their flawed arguments. I stand prepared to answer any questions. Great. Any questions of this witness? Senator Walsh. Mr. Inquire. Go right ahead. Mr. Hillis, what is the wage? Are you a contractor? I missed that part. I'm sorry. I'm a citizen. I have no dog in the fight. But since the state has no moonbeam of money, I didn't ask you that. I'm, it's my yeah, inquiry. Well, I, I asked if you were a contractor. I am not a contractor. You're not a contractor. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Make sure you turn in a witness form. <coughs> I found out there's five more people next door that want to testify in support. So I will take one more support, and then I'll do three opposition, and we'll come back to support after that. I feel this kind of gives a better balance argument to the committee and it tends to spur a few more questions um, throughout the process. So someone else in support of Senate Bill 30.
there's anyone next door, now is your time to come. Well, they're in opposition. That's a detail I kind of got glossed over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyone else in support? All right, anyone in opposition? I like the red because it's Valentine's Day this week. Would you please be the first? <laughs> A reminder to all committee members, it is Valentine's Day this week. There you are. Get your gifts now. Right. Chairman, my name is Emily Martin. I am president of Ashinger Electric Company in Benton, Missouri, and I am here on behalf of both Ashinger Electric Company and the St. Louis Electrical Contractors Association, or NECA. We represent 300 and, uh, 303 employers and approximately 4,000 uh, trade employees and we're testifying in opposition to this bill. Um, in response to what was just testified, uh, there's no limit of competition uh, under prevailing wage. What the prevailing wage law states is that there is a set minimum wage for a particular scope of work, for work per performed by a particular craft. Um, it all, anybody can compete under the prevailing wage, it, and the prevailing wage problem that there has been is that there is not adequate reporting. If all contractors would participate in reporting, and I understand there are some things that the Missouri Department of Labor has been working on in order to make reporting, provide online reporting, then the prevailing wage would truly reflect what is the correct wage for that area. What's the wage that's being paid for that work in that particular location? I believe that that's where a lot of the claims of inflated pricing are coming from is the fact that there is not equal, there's not reporting that's being done. We make that opportunity to report um, more available. I understand the Department of Labor is working on that or are, already has taken care of that problem. Then there's not a problem with the prevailing wage. Secondarily, uh, as to the other remark that was made um, from the first opponent, with regard to school construction. There is data on school construction. And for, in our region, for elementary school and university school construction, there was no statistical difference between the square foot cost of construction in Missouri and that square foot cost of construction for schools and universities in non-prevailing wage states. In secondary school construction in Missouri, this is data that goes back from 2004 through 2010. Uh, secondary school construction was $175.96 per square foot in Missouri. Average non-prevailing wage states that surround us, $185.31 per square foot. So actually under prevailing wage, Missouri contractors are producing secondary school construction for $13.35 a square foot, less than in our non-prevailing wage neighbors. Thank you. Very good. Is there any questions of this witness? Ms. Martin, how, do you know how the prevailing wage since your contractor, how it's set? Yes, I do. Um, we report, and as a contractor, uh, my company participates, we report the wages that we have paid in the different locations where we have worked. So we work all the way through the Boot Hill, Missouri. So in each of those counties, we'll report the number of hours that we work, and we'll report the wage that we pay and what classification we're working under. That opportunity to report is open to everyone, and the prevailing wage is set by the wage that's paid for the most number of hours that are reported so in one, that one hour could set So it. one hour could set it. If one hour was reported, an hour could set the wage. Do you pay a different wage in, say, Chaplin than you do in St. Louis County? Um, my do you know uh, Yes, yes, there are different. In fact, I just bid a project, um, or prepared a bid for a project that went in in Springfield last week, and that wage rate was, off the top of my head, I'm going to tell you, it was in the 10 to 15% difference from the wage rate that I pay on work that I'm doing in St. Louis City and St. Louis County right now. As a contractor, are you still making a profit? It's a contractor. You can, you know, yeah, there's a lot of things that go into that number. Are the variables <laughs> different in St. Louis County than, say, Springfield? Certainly they are. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Senator Curls. Thank you. Can we Go right ahead. So, and I understand, you report. I, I know it's not a requirement that you have to report. Correct. 
um, are you at all aware of how many other folks may be in, you said you were in Springfield? So no, I'm in uh, the St. Louis County is where I am. Oh, you are in yeah. St. Louis County. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, okay, I guess, and you may not be able to answer that. I was just curious as to how many folks in those other rural areas actually reported to kind of avoid, of course, the, the situation, of course, that the Senator has spoken about when you only have one person that reports and then that's a I am not aware, but I will tell you that the reporting process is fairly easy. Um, it's data that you're collecting in order to pay payroll anyway, so you're just producing it in another form. Thank you. Any further questions, Senator Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Absolutely. Let me uh, ask you a question. Uh, you say the Department of Labor now is trying to kind of maybe come up with a my understanding is they may have already done so, yes. For all counties or for? My understanding is that they are putting together or have put together an online reporting system for all counties, correct? For the counties to report in? For the contractors that work in those counties to report in, rather than doing the paper reporting, which is how we've done it in the past. This issue is not going to be over today by no means. Uh, but. I would like to see for sure there come to some census. And I'm trying to think, I know the the idea, and, I, and some of my colleagues have mentioned the idea of reporting the bond report. Uh, you're going to hear Bill Shorter, but in third class counties, that just don't happen very much. There's 90 third class, I'm saying it can or what, I don't know, but they don't at the end of the day. But I also think that a wage can be established in those counties, even if the, say, Department of Labor would maybe look at it from just the opposite way. Maybe they decide what the prevailing wage are in those counties by, by getting information from jobs there. Statistic-wise, they could also have that on file. <coughs> Instead of putting, and I, I know it's a different concept, but I, I'm not sure why we can't do it just the opposite and have a contract report. I understand, yes, yeah, there may be additional ways to put the, um, put more of the burden on the Department of Labor to do the data collection. Um, I know just from my dealings with the Department of Labor that uh, they're probably understaffed to do that. So we're going to take something that now we're asking the private citizens to do voluntarily and and uh, probably going to need to come up with some money to pay for that data collection. Well, but, I, but I think it is possible to get that done. If it, if it, just like you're sharp enough to know what it is in Springfield, what it is in St. Louis, and probably know what it is in Bottle Reserve, my own town. Uh, but I but I think we might need to try sometimes to get outside the normal routine we do. Maybe just do that. There may be some change the burden a little bit. Certainly, right. certainly. Thank Senator Watson. Uh, just to follow up on, on what we just discussed, I, one of the problems I've got, not my county now after the first year, but Douglas County was one of my counties. And they need a new jail, they need a new school, they need a new courthouse, they, they need lots of things. Um, I couldn't tell you when the last prevailing wage job would have been in Douglas County. It could have been reported. I, I, I don't even know what it would have been. And it, if you don't mind, um, I'm going to correct what I believe is a, um, mis, a misunderstanding of prevailing wage. Um, we report not just the wages that were paid on prevailing wage projects, but we also report the wages that were paid on private projects. Because the idea is to reflect the wage that's being paid for that work that prevails in that area, not just what's being paid on public work. Because if all you did was report my public work projects, all you'd get was the prevailing wage perpetuating itself over and over well, again. The problem is, quite honestly, in Douglas County, and you're probably not too familiar, there's probably not a lot of private work. Going well, on. and you know, so I might report, you know, the uh, 15 hours that I spent, you know, rewiring, adding a receptacle and a new data drop for the new cash register at the pharmacy. It could be that simple. But I agree, there may be some other ways that the that the Department of Labor could look at other statistical about data. about Springfield probably being a little different than St. Louis. Exactly. Frankly, Douglas County, not that far from Springfield, but I guarantee you there's quite a little difference. And, and you're, and you're certainly right, but I would certainly imagine that somebody has to have done something related to the construction trades within the past year there. When we get there. down to it, I think it cost your company and your people jobs. Even. If, if Douglas County could get those things done a little cheaper, they might do it. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I, I right now they're just sitting there saying, oh, we don't have the money to do this. 
I understand your point, but I think that that, again, comes back to um, reporting as opposed to abolishing of the prevailing wage. Not um, arguing, I just, but something got to change. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Senator Curls. Thank you. Um, okay, so, it's, forgive me, this is probably a dumb question. Walk, walk me through again what the reporting process is. So, you say when you, tell me about that process. Okay, you're able to do it very easily um, through some electronic version. Uh, and I'm going to tell you that we've done paper reporting. I do not know if the electronic version is available yet. I just haven't been that close to it. <coughs> but what we do is we essentially get these pieces of paper and we, you know, which county did we work in, how many hours did we work in that county, and what was the rate of pay and what were the benefit uh, dollars that we paid in that county. So we do that for each county that we work in. Okay. So, so it is not necessarily a lot of paperwork. No, it's not necessarily a lot of paperwork. In, in fact, I think the Department of Labor, at least at one point, one of their representatives was suggesting they would prefer, instead of us doing it on an annual basis, that we do it on a monthly basis or more frequently. I, I don't know if that made it easier for them to deal with the data, but again, it's all data that you're collecting to produce your payroll every week. It's not any more difficult than just adding those hours together. Same sort of stuff I did. I did my OSHA log you know, a week and a half ago same sort of information I need for that. So just out of curiosity, so what do you think might prohibit folks from reporting? I mean, because it seems to me, even as we talk about prevailing wage and some of those you know, the areas where the um, labor may not cause as much as the course in St. Louis County, sure. if they then just report what they're paying or wanting to pay or what they pay their folks, that would then set the wage. So Correct. why do you think then that folks may not report? I mean, do you think there are the barriers? Do you think it would be easier if we had some electronic I think it would very likely be easier if there was something that was electronic. I think that there is a misunderstanding of what the reporting requirements are. Um, I have heard and I've talked about this issue with a number of your colleagues over a number of years and I've heard repeatedly that you know there's a huge cost to reporting. Um, I've heard things of that nature which, which are not true but probably come from people that have never reported reported and, and feel that there's some barrier there. So I think maybe an education process. I know we had a representative from the Department of Labor actually come and talk to a number of our contractors on how to do the reporting. So there's certainly some education and outreach that could be done that would help make that process easier. It, it's not difficult right now, but instructions are always helpful. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any further We've heard from everyone except for Senator Wallingford and Senator Munzlinger. You want to round us out, Senator Munzlinger? I can do that. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Listening to what you said, really, if the reporting was done in the third class counties, which I have a lot of, uh, then the wages would be very realistic for that area. Is that what you were saying? They would reflect those that reported, correct. Really, I don't see any difference in doing away with prevailing wage or doing the reporting in those third class counties then. Can you give me a difference then if it would reflect the actual wage if there was reporting done? If, or if it was done away with? Because if you did away with it, it seems like it would make it a whole lot simpler. Well, I think there are a number of um, things that are negative impacts that come from doing away with the prevailing wage that were essentially it, throwing the baby out with the bathwater if we say, well, you know what, it, it's just easier to just not do away the prevailing wage rather than do the reporting and actually reflect what the correct wages are in your community. But if those were jobs were being done, that would be the actual wages that would be in the community. Expl I, mean, I, I, explain. I, I, under I understand where you're going. And I'll tell you that there are a number of things that happen um, repeatedly in non-prevailing wage states that I think um, don't happen in states that still maintain a prevailing wage that reflects the wage in that community. Um, there are a lot of, I'm going to call them transactional contractors, who will be coming, who come in from other states, other areas, bring with them that transactional workforce that are not citizens of the state of Missouri, certainly aren't paying Missouri taxes, certainly aren't buying goods and services produced by other Missouri businesses, and you start to create a climate where that becomes 
um, those contractors are certainly going to be taking advantage of the opportunity to come in and take work away from the people in your community that may be currently doing that work. Okay, you made a good point there. But if there's prevailing wage jobs done in my area, most of those contractors would be from outside of my area anyway. But Whereas those, if it was opened up and free bidding process, I have some local contractors that do very good work that would keep everything there in the local tax base. There is a free bidding process. The free bidding process just states that this is the minimum wage you'll pay for this work. And if those contractors are reporting, then the minimum wage you will pay for that work is the wage that those contractors are performing. That's other exactly work what I said while we go. <laughs> I, I do not believe that there is a compelling reason to do away with the prevailing wage. I think we can solve a lot of this through reporting so that the wages are reflective of those paid in the community for the work being done. You've, you've just, we've just gone full circle. I did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> if it's done away with or the reporting actually goes forward, it's the same. Same wages. I, I do not believe that that's so. Enlighten me then. I, I believe that what we just talked about will happen, that you will have transactional contractors that are going to come in. They're going to undercut the living wage that the people in your community are paying, and then they're going to leave with your money. <coughs> no different than somebody coming in from outside the area doing a prevailing wage job and leaving the area. But in that case, at least your contractors in your community that are paying what is the prevailing wage in your area are going to be on an even, even competitive field with those contractors. Um, if your guys are paying 12 bucks an hour and somebody can bring a bunch of people and, um, up from one of our neighboring states and they're going to pay them um, 8 bucks or 7 and no health care and uh, no other benefits, then that's going to change the competitive field for the local contractors that you have and your local workforce. Senator Wallingford. <laughs> Did I go over my three minutes? Question, questions and answers. We, we, we want to learn. I'm very open-minded on this issue, and I've had people from both sides do some with me on, on it. And the optimistic thing is that both sides agree on one thing that it's broke and it needs to be fixed. And I find that very encouraging because of people want to keep the status quo and others want to change it. Now we have a problem. So knowing that it's broke and people want to fix it, it hasn't happened over the years. Um, why hasn't it been addressed really seriously from both sides? What's, what's keeping us from reaching a consensus? <laughs> I will tell you that I have participated um, last year specifically and in other times in sitting down in, um, let's say, roundtable discussions that have involved uh, members of this body and uh, individuals who are on both sides of this issue to have those discussions, um, but they have, there has not been a consensus reached. I don't think there's been enough of a push to get to that consensus. What? What would have to take place for that to happen? I think that I think that we could we can get together and there are some things and I think one of them basically is having that report is having that reporting done, having a, a very usable uh, tool to do the reporting having education on how to do the reporting, maybe, you know, taking that around so that everybody gets an opportunity to learn throughout the state how to do that. And um, perhaps then the Department of Labor also looking at how to set that rate in counties where maybe there has been no reporting. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there was one more. Senator Walsh. Ms. Martin, um, you don't think we should throw out the prevailing wage law. Do you like, as a contractor, uh, complying to all the OSHA laws to protect your workers? 
I would like to have them all be safe at the end of the day, but there are some things that you might think are a little more onerous than others. So do you think we should throw those laws out? I don't think so. Thank you. Any further questions of this witness? None. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next up. Go with the guy right here. He, he, you, were, you were chomping at the bit. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Please state Thank your name you. and begin. My name is Randy Long. I'm from Southwest Missouri, <laughs> Law School District. Um, we apologize, Spot. We have. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, I am a mechanical contractor. I've been in business in the HVA business since 1982. Started in this construction field in 1971. Been in a long time. My first. Uh, we are a non-union contractor. Have been and always, you know, always have. Been. I was invited here by a labor organization to be advised of this. You know, my men, when you subject them in this construction work, you know, we want good quality men. It preserves integrity of the work they're doing, that they do good quality work. To have that done, you have to pay a good quality wage to have that work done. Everybody deserves a good quality wage in this day and time. We don't need out-of-state workmen coming in at a lesser rate, as was mentioned a while ago, to compete with us. I mean, prevailing wage uh, needs to be protected for that reason. Uh, I have people that have retired from my firm that have had 25 years of service recently. I've got two on my firm that's been with me over 20 years. Uh, you know, we provide, as uh, she mentioned, even though we're non-union, we provide group insurance and paid vacations. You know, I've got a very good background of men that have stuck with me and uh, as uh, a lot of the labor organizations southwest Missouri can testify you know, we, I, I pride ourselves in good quality work and these men when they earn a good wage living want them to do good quality work many of you have had substandard work done just because of substandard payments and wages and on the prevailing wage issue we um, do electronically submit our prevailing wage forms on the numerous public projects we're involved in. I have schools going right now. We finished uh, we finished courthouses, public buildings, and we do provide them electronically to the general contractors or to the school boards if it be such. Or recently, we done a renovation at the Christian County Courthouse, of which they were provided all the prevailing wage information. This these documents are reviewed uh, upon uh, asking by the Missouri Department of Labor if somebody wants to issue a, uh, a uh, summary or somebody else can say the proper term for it, then these reports are all reviewed by the Department of Labor. Where we need teeth in this law on the prevailing wage is to make sure that everybody is not falsifying these reports. You will have firms that are reporting 40 man hours for their employees, and actually they're only paying, they'll, they'll report 40, and they're paying them 20 hours at the prevailing wage rate. Or they'll write down 20 hours as such and get 40 hours out of them just to compensate them. And that's not fair for any of us to try to pay the prevailing wage correctly. You've reached the three minute time limit. I Thank appreciate you. it. Hold on a second. Is there any questions of this witness? Senator Curls. Um, thank you for being here today. And I did want to say that the young lady that just said earlier did a very good job. Really, she was first and probably there to run the most of the questions because of that. That's why I but, called her uh, up. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, in one part of the state, I'm sorry. I'm Southwest Missouri. Southwest Missouri. So, you have found in this, that most of the workers that you then hire come from the local, um, Our local area, yes. Do you work outside of your municipality in your area? Uh, I have in the past. Uh -huh. We have done uh, we have done military base work as far as Oceana Naval Air Station, Virginia Beach, uh, Marine Corps Air, Air Corps in South Carolina in the past. Um, okay. I have worked outside the state of Missouri. Uh, we used to work all over northern Missouri as a doing a lot of school work or courthouse work. So, do you think, and, and you may not, you may or may not know this that most of the folks who may um, do contract work outside of their locality, then 
potentially, do you feel that most of them probably take their own workers to the new locality, or do you think they have some kind of equal numbers of their workers and those that are hired within that locality? There is a mix. You know, you try to hire, hire locally if you can, to save the right. travel expense. You want to put your supervisory personnel in, in place in them areas. Uh, you know, it, sometimes it don't work. You have to take your own workers because the workforce may not be available. And that's another reason why we need the prevailing wage to continue, where the workers want to stay in the construction field. Right. And, and those times that you're able to do electronic reporting, did you find that that process was difficult? Did you no. find it was relatively easy? Anybody can bid the prevailing wage. It's very simple to report. It's, it's very simple with your wage reports when you're figuring your your uh, withholding to it's a very simple form now with the computer industry the way it is it's, it's very simple <coughs> any further questions seeing none thank you for your testimony the next person what is this my testimony if you've never heard of. <laughs> are you gonna are you testifying yes and you are Tim Green you look kind of familiar. Former Senator Tim Green, it's always a pleasure to have you before the committee. Thank Pass you. out your uh, information. But even though you are an esteemed former member of this body, you're still held to that three minute time limit. Yes. Actually, actually I, I might just get you, you're about down to two. <laughs> I'm here to testify uh, so I can be quick and brief to both bills, Senate Bill 68 and Senate Bill 30, so we do not have to be repetitious. I did a PowerPoint presentation on prevailing wage this past summer, the pros and the cons. So I'm just going to go through that PowerPoint presentation I did real quickly so that you get a gist of what I'm trying to say. The first page is basically the statutory statement of prevailing wage. The reason and the intent was to stabilize local wages, prevent unfair and unregulated bidding, and it enables localities to protect itself economically. Why the lowest and not the best? Well, if you look at your state statutes, professional services such as architects, engineers, attorneys, financial managers, information technology, they're required to go with the best provider. But in construction on public works, they're required to go with the lowest responsive, responsible bidder. So when you're dealing with contracting, you do not give the local municipality or the local political subdivision the freedom to go with the best all the time because low is, is in, in the uh, statute. Last year it was dealt with that we need a lower prevailing wage because of the tornado in Joplin. Just to give you some quick facts, after the Hurricane Katrina, <coughs> September 2005, President Bush signed an executive order suspending prevailing wage rates. Bush wrote that his decision was justified because Davis-Bacon increases construction costs the average wage at the time was $9 an hour. The minimum wage was $5.15 an hour. Gulf Coast workers and businesses complained. While the federal government was spending more than $60 billion on recovery, locals complained that out-of-state companies received most of the contracts and that many of those firms pay workers less than the prevailing wage. Forty-five days later, <coughs> President Bush reinstated the prevailing wage. You had the tragic tornado in Joplin, May 22, 2011. After the tornado, out-of-state contractors flooded the area. Joplin Public Schools reached out to the state for help. Uh, the Division of Labor Standards officials have been assisting Joplin ever since. Uh, an Atlanta-based firm was hired to handle the demolition, violated the prevailing wage law. Over $50,000 is still owed to the workers there, and a lot of the local contractors who are non-union were complaining because they were put in an unlevel playing field. Um, there is a study that was done back in 2001 and was updated in 2011 dealing with the economic <coughs> impact we have on our state budget due to income tax uh, wages brought in to provide general revenue dollars that brings in 300 to 452 million and then when people have more money they purchase when they purchase they pay sales tax i'm doing both bills so can i just finish quickly one more minute go ahead one more minute so you got both bills right the next page so you know when everyone complains about union contractors 
that's the investment close to a billion dollars in the last five years their pensions have invest, invested in the state of Missouri. I sat on Mosier's for eight years. We have not invested one dime of pension dollars in infrastructure in the state of Missouri. The next or quick miss about prevailing wage. Um, there's no point in participating. That's false if you submit your wage rate is determined. 465 individual con contractors participated in 2011. Over the past 10 years, there have been 61 objections filed. So there's 114 counties, the city of St. Louis, times that by 18 different occupational titles, times that by 10. And all you've had is 61 objections. Public works construction is more expensive in 18 states. Public works construction data shows clearly prevailing wage states spend less on the square foot, and that is on the previous two pages. And then the state of Missouri, as of the second week of January, does allow online reporting. Very good. Thank you for your testimony. Is there any questions of the witness? Seeing none, thank you. <laughs> I did not see a big screen for that film for for both. Uh, I did. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> How's it feel to be over there, Senator? Much more easier. I don't know if I'll have the impact I have though over there. But I do want to answer uh, the senator from Cape Girardeau's inquiry. Uh, there have been several of us in talks with Senator Parson and others about ways to reach some type of solution. And there were. There were many attempts last year to come to a solution, and I think Senator from Phelps can confirm that. Any further questions? Any other questions? Uh, first off, Senator Walsh, then I'm going to follow up, and then. So it is your opinion, Senator, that uh, it's a reporting problem? My opinion is the complaint is due to a reporting problem, but I believe there is a solution that can resolve the issue if we all want to sit down and seriously talk about it. Thank you. Senator Wallen. I just want to respond to something you said. You said you were in talks with several people. You've made progress. Uh, how far apart were you and how close are we now? Well, that's in the opinion of the beholder. Uh, <laughs> Senator, <laughs> Senator from Phelps will probably tell you we're very far apart. Um, I think we're closer than I think we could have come closer than we did last year, but that's history. So let's move forward. Think it's possible to get it done this year? I think everything in society is possible if people really want to work things out. I'm an optimist. I'm trying not to be cynical. <clears throat> is everyone engaged in the process, or is there? I think you'll need to talk to several of your colleagues because the ultimate decisions are made by senators, not by special interest. you like that one? <laughs> I'll give you a seat. So, technically, you're a lobbyist now, right? Yes. Where did you buy your first Gucci suit and alligator shoes? <laughs> I'm a construction electrician. I cannot afford those shoes. Parties. Very good. Thank you, so, uh, Senator Green, for your uh, for PowerPoint. Someone else in opposition. I got the guy right here in the in the blue jacket. He's up next. Welcome. State your name and go ahead and begin. Uh, my name is Leon Keller, uh, <coughs> Vice President of Meyer Electric Company, a local firm. We've been in business in this area since 1968. We work in a general area. We work all of Central Missouri, all over what we call the rural area, and not in Kansas City and St. Louis. I'm speaking today in opposition of SB 30 and with we'll SB 68. Uh, we're also uh, also a member of, and past president of Builders Association. Uh, Builders Association is headquartered in Kansas City. It has service centers in Springfield, Jeff City, and Springfield, and Columbia. The membership of the Builders Association is 900 members in the commercial building construction industry throughout central and western Missouri. Our members employ 20,000 people, approximately. Our membership is split evenly between union and non-union contractors. 
I think a, a lot of the other witnesses have uh, tested the things, but I think I want to touch a little bit on the social issues and uh, how it, it uh, affects the actual person. And, and over the years, historical investment of private dollars in employee training, employee health care, employee retirement programs have made made by private companies into these funds. The proposed change in SB 30 and SB B, SB 68 are profound enough to directly affect those important investments. The prevailing wage statutes impact these investments for the, for the, the other reasons. I had to write some of this down because then we got three minutes. Prevailing wage laws help ensure that local and state workers are utilized for public projects. Prevailing wages are public projects help keep work with Missouri employers and therefore Missouri employees. Reducing construction wages on public projects opens the door for low-cost, out-of-state employers and workers to gain Missouri taxpayer projects. During high unemployment, I don't believe that is what the legislator really wants to happen. I'll give you a quick example. There's a large uh, private funded retail center built in Columbia, Missouri. I went there on a Saturday evening at 7 o'clock during construction. There was 40 bricklayers and 15 hot carriers working at 7 o'clock on Saturday night. I went back Sunday and they were working from daylight to dark. The contractor was out in Texas. I would say there was a real strong possibility that most of the workers were undocumented workers. Currently, Missouri has a decent system to ensure workers are fully paid on public projects with the use of weekly prevailing wage reporting of all on-site workers. <clears throat> This does not ensure can ask you to pay with, just sum it up real quick. Okay, like the next twenty seconds. Right. All right. Prevailing wage laws level the playing field and competition. The laws protect Missouri workers. Missouri prevailing wage initiative helps reduce poverty by ensuring that construction or other or affected workers earn enough income to stay above the poverty line and remain as taxpayers. This relieves the state programs that struggle every year to help Missouri's laws on other unfortunate cities. Very good. Any questions of this witness? Thank you very much for your testimony. Next person in opposition. Going once. Going twice. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Denise Hastie. I'm Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Associated General Contractors, the AGC of St. Louis. The AGC of St. Louis is comprised of 400 corporate members, and our membership encompasses commercial, industrial, heavy and highway contractors, industry partners, and related firms in 23 counties on the eastern side of the state, both union and open shop. Our association supports the concept of prevailing wage and does not support large-scale changes to the current prevailing wage statutes. Prevailing wage statutes were put into place to level the playing field, as you've heard already today, and we believe that in general terms, the statutes as exist today provide that level playing field. We do agree with previous testimony that reporting seems to be the issue. In a meeting last session on this issue, um, along with senators and uh, members of the industry, a senator in that meeting reported that in 2011, 70% of Missouri counties had not one wage hour reported. So reporting does seem to be an issue. SB 30 would repeal all of those uh, prevailing wage laws and it would do irreparable harm to our member firms who did public work throughout the state. I'm open to questions. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Anyone else to top testify in opposition? How many more after this? It's going to be here a long time. <coughs> All right, show us how it's done. 
Senator, my name is Mike Lewis. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Missouri AFL-CIO, and I would like the record to reflect that the Missouri AFL-CIO proposes this legislation and fully supports those who have testified against it. Very good. Any questions? A fine example of testimony. <laughs> I hope that others live up to that level. Who's next? Come on down. Dark hat you. Come on down and get the offense. For the record, Terry Briggs, I'm a registered lobbyist for the Site Improvement Association. We're a construction trade association out of the St. Louis and Eastern Missouri area. My testimony is in writing and in the interest of brevity, Mr. Chairman, I will submit my written testimony on this and also Senate Bill 68. Next. Next. I'll be happy to answer any questions. We do have concerns. Doing away with the law is not the answer. You know, reporting periods are contractors report. You actually get a wage for that local area. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony on both bills. Come on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Nancy Ginza, registered lobbyist for Construction Employers Coalition, and I would like to go on record in opposition to both Senate Bill 30 and Senate Bill 68, and I will not waste any more of your time for now. Very good. Any questions? Senator Walsh. <coughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator. Who do, you, who do you represent? Construction Employers Coalition. It's a group of subcontractors based out of St. Louis. Sides is a member along with PDF and um, ASA. And are they both union and non-union members? Yes, correct. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Chief. Is there anyone after this fine gentleman that would like to testify? Bring us home. Mr. Chairman, appreciate the time, members of the committee. My name is Raymond Heffer. I'm a registered lobbyist for the state of Missouri. I'm speaking on behalf of the Plumbing Industry Council, the Missouri Association of Plumbing and Cooling Contractors, and the Chicago Contractors <coughs> National Association of St. Louis Chapter. I'd like to go on record in opposition to Senate Bill 30 and Senate Bill 68. How big is your business card? Run back. <laughs> so, oh, well, we got a question. You guys sit back down. Do you have both open and closed shop employees? I mean, the, the Plumbing Industry Council, no. The Sheet Metal Air Conditioning Contractors National Association, St. Louis Chapter, no. The Missouri Association of Plumbing Heating Board Contractors, it's a statewide asso association of uh, union and non union companies. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. What? Is it no. I asked if he was the last one. I was raising my hand. He was. He did. I was. He, 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 he didn't search the waiting. floor. Do you guys know who you're sticking up for here? I'm <laughs> grateful. <laughs> Go right ahead, sir. Mr. Chairman, Senators, I'm David Ferris, appearing today on behalf of the Missouri uh, Mechanical Contractors Association of the Eastern District and Mechanical Contractors Association of Kansas City. Uh, we stand in opposition to both uh, Senate Bill 30 and 68. Thank you very much. Any questions of this? Senator Walsh. Good afternoon, Mr. Clerch. Are your members as well open and closed shop? They are. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. You. Is there anyone else that wants to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 30? Seeing none, that will conclude the testimony for Senate Bill 30. Next up, Senate Bill 68 by Senator Parson. Senator Brown, thank you. Thank you. So we have Parson Brown. <laughs> Is there like a Christmas song about that? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Parsons represent the 28th Senatorial District. Uh, I won't be a long time on explaining this. It's basically uh, prevailing wage in third class county, which there is 90 in the state, and it's doing away with prevailing wage and going actually with the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, using it for a source of that. However, uh, I would like the committee to know 
for anybody that's listening also. I think the we as senators have an obligation to somehow figure out and get this to a result. This has been going on for years and years. And as all the testimony on both sides have you heard today, there's no doubt that the prevailing wage in St. Louis, Springfield, or Bottle River, Missouri is different. Everybody testifies to that. And when you almost get down to it is how do you collect the data? And for whatever reason, we haven't been able to do that, whether it's the, our local contractors fault at home, for whatever reason they're not doing it. But there's got to be a way that we can come together as a body in this chamber to figure out how do we collect the data? How do we get the information that's fair for the employees and the employers and for the contractors, for the people that's municipalities and schools and doing jobs? <coughs> Um, and I, I truly believe there's a way to get there. There's a, and, and I want to say this on my bill, regardless whether I use the standard that I mentioned in here, whether we have the Missouri Extensions compile this information, third class guys and local levels, or a resource to collect the information that we truly know what is for fair on both sides. But uh, I'd really like to see this thing, we, we figure out a way to come to a resolution on this. And, and I think we can, because I think all sides agree that there is a difference in wages in the state. We just need to figure out how do we fairly do that for everyone on both sides that we can do this. And uh, mine's a little bit self-serving because I am from third, all my districts, third class counties, uh, for the most part, there's 90 of them in the state of the county. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's the quick version of Senate Bill 16. Very good. Do you have a witness or you'd like to call? I do not. By a show of hands, how many people would like to testify in favor? And by a show of hands, how many would like to testify in opposition? Okay, if you testified in opposition to the previous bill, allow others to go first, and then when you come up, they're similar in nature. I would love to hear a Me Too or something similar rather than a regurgitation of, of the previous testimony. So with that, if you're testifying in support, Mr. Hobrock, come on up. <coughs> Senator, I'm going to take a little stance on, on the testimony, my testimony a minute ago. It's going to be entirely different. I want to address why people don't report. Uh, I elect to report on my insulators because all the insulators do around the state of Missouri is insulate. They don't do any other trade. So I report it's easy. My carpenters, on the other hand, do not. And they do multiple tasks when they go in and do a project. You can take anything that we do, and I like to use the example of cutting a new door in a gas station, which requires me to cut an opening into to the wall and knock the wall out. That's labor. I have a bobcat on site, and that's an operator. I have to move a plumbing line, and that's a plumber. I have to install a uh, exit sign over the exit, and that's an electrician. I'm going to pour a little bit of concrete, and that's a concrete finisher. And obviously, I'm going to put a door in, that's a carpenter. And then I'm going to paint it, and that's a painter. So what did I just cover? Eight trades? I'm going to send three men out there, and we'll be done in 12 hours. And in order to submit that information to the division, the accounting nightmare it creates for me is ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous because the division demands and audits and scrutinizes and grills me over Mr. Hobrock. How can you be for sure he only spent two hours painting? We think it was two and a half. Well, since you can't be sure, we're not going to accept the hour. That's why. Open shop contractors are not treated fairly by the division. That's everybody, in room, everybody that's involved with the system knows it. And we do work differently. If you did this union, you would have an electrical contractor out there, and he'd report his electrical hours. You'd have a carpentry contractor out there. They'd report the carpentry hours. And I'm telling you guys, the guys in the third class counties, these guys do it all. And they're not going to break the time down so that they make the division labor standards happy. That's what's wrong with the system. That's the biggest problem with the system. And then the division itself beats up on these guys. They want to stay seven states away from them. That's why it needs to be changed. Any questions for the witness? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so you said that non-union shops are not treated fairly by the division. Absolutely. The state, you mean the state division? Absolutely. Hmm. Okay. 
So, um, I know we heard plenty of testimony saying that the recording was, was actually not difficult for those that needed to report. But I guess I wanted to... It may not be difficult for them. Okay, well, let me ask you this. How much of a disparity have you found with the prevailing wage in your area as opposed to what you pay the folks that are doing the work? Um, probably case? double. You found that the prevailing wage in this area is double? double? So do you report it all to be able to report your wages so that that for then... Set I, I report every wage I paid on my insulator shifts. I do not report. I elect not to report on my carpenters, my iron workers, my electricians. I don't report on them. Okay, so let me ask you this then. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, what made you report on the insulators as opposed to the others that you did? Uh, because I can make a difference in the counties we work in. We employ a lot and it's a single trade. These guys don't do anything but that, so it's easy to track. And you don't think it's easy to set that standard in those other areas either? Absolutely not, because now my guys, my carpenters, have got to break their time card down every day accurately into the tasks they do each day. They do multiple tasks, multiple occupational <laughs> titles all on the same day. And you've had an experience where then the state did not accept your reporting for some of the state has said? beat me up more times than you can count, Senator. Okay, so they've been refused the report that you submitted? Uh, I've been drugged down there by different people on objections. I have been personally insulted by them. I've been at hearings where the opposing counsel uh, huddles with the commission during recesses. If anybody thinks it's a fair system, they got to come and watch the comical court that goes on. Um, and then I guess my next question is not necessarily to this witness, but um, I'm wondering at some point whether there's someone from the department here as well, so maybe we can hear. Sure. Um, I have a few questions for them after we Thank you. Any other questions for this witness? Chairman had to go for a few minutes. Vice Chairman, <laughs> Bill, I guess I'm the third removed. Something, I don't know. <laughs> No other questions? All right. Uh, next, anyone else to testify in favor? Seeing none, anyone to testify against? Step right up. We'll take Southwest Missouri board first. Mm -hmm. uh, in opposition to this, one of the main things that this bill needs to preserve is the integrity quality of work and the construction is a capital quality of work. And uh, I know the system needs realignment. <coughs> there, there's no doubt about that and the reporting of it. Is that, you know, I feel sorry for my constituents being beat up by the Department of Labor. We have been, uh, you know, investigated numerous times as being a non-union contractor and I always feel like I've been treated fair. But, uh, uh, they have always done their job. Maybe that's because uh, we we break out our independent trades as needed. We are working as a general contractor on a project. In other words, doing a mechanical contractor as a total package for the bond on these public projects. We make sure we break out our individual trades. The state has always accepted that time. So, you know, we've been very fortunate, I guess, that I haven't been beat up on the state. I do respect the state for the way in their investigation. So, Any question for this witness? Yes, go ahead. Mr. Long, have the hours you've submitted ever resulting, resulted in setting the minimum wage in a county? We have, uh, we get programs from the state asking for <laughs> our wages paid both on private and public projects and we submit them to the state, and that's how they are supposed to determine the providing wage for that right. for those areas. So, I, you know, I've we come have and listened to some yes. of the hearings before, and yes. I've seen some trades lose and some contractors win, so I guess what I'm saying is your lower wage that you might have paid, then you said you don't pay a lower wage, you pay a substantial wage to your employees. If there's any doubt on a trade preference, you always pay the higher prevailing wage just to make sure you're covered with the Department of Labor. How many employees do you employ? I typically run around 20. I have run as much as 40 in the past two years. We just recently completed three major commercial you projects. Had two, you've had 40 people working I've had for 40 you? I've had 40 people working for me. That's a lot right now in this economy. Yes, we just recently completed a big casino project on the border, across the border, as well as a couple of big commercial projects in the Springfield area. Thank you. 
Senator Curls. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sorry, forgive me. Did you say you had union and non-union employees? No, I have all non-union. All non-union. So all do you feel you've been treated treated differently at all by the department ever? I, I feel like they've been very fair to me. Okay. I have had them come in. In fact, if they want to audit my prevailing wage records, they can come. We can email to them, or they can come in. They don't even. They come into my office. We'll open the files to them, and they they can sit down at a conference table and get what they need. Right. Has any of your reporting ever been refused by the state of Missouri? No, never has. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Representative Munchling. What? I'm just Senator Munchling. I'm doing that. Thor, I like it over there too. Uh, thank you for being here today. I just had a question. Since you're non-union, your guys, I guess, do multitask. Um, some do. I've got different trades that I employ to do all different aspects. So, you know, I do have insulators. I do have pipe fitters. I do have sheet metal mechanics. I've got control electricians. Would they pick up a hammer and nail and do a little carpenter work too? Uh, I usually don't. If it's a carpenter, I will hire out and sub out to a carpenter to do the subcontract. Even if your guys were knowledgeable of what they were doing, you'd still uh, I, I have somebody still, else I prefer to have carpenters. Put a door in. They'll bring the carpenter or mail right in to do this. Uh, that drug up your thoughts with what you're doing? Um, it just protects me. Protects you from what? It just protects me to make sure that all the prevailing wage reports, that everything is done correctly. But if also, you have guys that are perfectly capable of doing it, you, know, you, you feel like you need protection from what? Well, they may not be as skilled at putting the door in as a carpenter. Obviously, that sounds real simple, but everything has a designated trade in a preference. My men are plumbers or sheet metal mechanics. And, uh, you know, I like to leave the trade profession to the trade profession as designated. So if you had a job that, like Mr. Holbrock said, you might actually have to subcontract for three or four other That's people. correct. That's correct. Roofers. Uh, and uh, we require if it's a public project that they turn in prevailing wage sheets. These all go to the public entity for review. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you. Next, anyone to testify <coughs> against? Where you been? timer so I'm guessing on three minutes. Yep, that's right. Okay, so I will keep it brief. Um, I really wanted to kind of structure my testimony today. Um, I believe the Senator, if I heard him correctly from the other room, spoke to, uh, a bit about the wage data system, but maybe his bill points right, to use in third class counties, and just kind of lay out what that, what, if this were to pass, what's the plans for that kind of system, what that looks like. Um, my name is Adam McBride. I'm a uh, registered lobbyist here today representing the Eastern and Western Missouri Laborers District Councils. Uh, represent about 14,000 construction craft laborers in the state of Missouri. So I think all of you probably by now have your folders. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen um, the first uh, section that you see, uh, that's the form that you need to report your wage rates. Okay? It's pretty cut and dry, pretty simple. The instructions are even included uh, on page two. Next, what you'll have, and I'm going to speak, again, I'm with the laborers. I will speak only on behalf of those that I represent. I pulled four different uh, annual wage orders. And so, for example, if you follow me, um, on the first one, it's for St. Louis County. The general laborer in St. Louis County, um, 2887 an hour, 1262, and friends benefits. It's health care, it's training, it's pension. Uh, roughly $40 an hour. So then I pulled a rural county on the eastern half of the state, and it's Mississippi County. Mississippi County, we're at twenty dollars and six cents, ten dollars and fifty-two cents in fringes. It's roughly a ten dollar an hour pay cut for a man that does the same hard work, and that's what we've negotiated. In fact, this happens to be our 
collective bargaining agreement rates because we did prevail in these two counties in the last one away to it. Um, again, it's us, you know, we hear a lot about metropolitan areas, uh, wage scales and non-metro. That man's working for 25% less based upon his geography. So then I wanted to pull from the eastern half of the state, just so we have Perry East and West. We've got Jackson County, and if you look at the general labor in Jackson County, it's roughly $39 an hour. If you look at the general labor in Polk County, wait, that's your home county, right? General labor in Polk County, is right at 30. Yeah. Yeah. Nine dollars or so an hour less in Polk County than Jackson County. Which leads me to, if you look at your next tab, uh, I like visuals. The blue counties on that map are your third class counties in the state of Missouri. Eighty some odd percent I'd say of the counties we have. Those are the counties that would be impacted by this legislation. And then finally, the last step that I want to hit, uh, the final section you'll see, um, most all of our third class counties fall in what they consider the non-metropolitan wage rate from the BLS statistics that, that this legislation has us look at. Uh, there are a handful, maybe like a Franklin County, that, that may fall in a metro area. Um, I didn't include the metro scales, I included what BLS puts out in this metro and non-metro area classification. Um, for your review. And so again, we've got our figures that I stated before. So these are my numbers. Now let's move to southeast Missouri. Mississippi County, I believe, again, it was 25% less an hour. Uh, we were at, what, roughly $30 an hour. In southeast Missouri, there's, for a general construction labor, it's just one category. It's a construction labor. This language has us look at the median on your three on the last okay. section, Senator, last section. It's the median hourly wage is what the legislation points us to look at within this, this data set. Uh, construction labor would be $14 an hour. Keep in mind that this federal wage survey data does not allow or provide for any type of benefits on top of a, a, an hourly wage, what's on the check. Uh, again, it would be check only. To, to clarify this data, and again, I want to go real quick over to Southwest Missouri. Um, Southwest Missouri is even more onerous uh, from my perspective. It's $12.61 an hour. Is what, under this language, the prevailing wage rate would be set up. Um, I don't know about you, obviously, I'm paid to represent people that work very hard, salt of the earth folks that work with their backs and their hands and not their pencils and their papers. Um, but I'll tell you, the, the retirees that I see who walk around like they look like they played the National Football League for 20 years because they worked with their back and they worked with their legs and their knees. I think they're worth more than $12.61 an hour. Amen. No matter where they're at. I think that the carpenter that died on the Mississippi River Bridge, building that new bridge, I think his family would tell you He's worth more than fourteen dollars an hour. Now I would I would actually get this thirty seconds. The only way the, the way that I'd like to close is I would actually encourage anyone. Uh, I can get you on a girder over the Missouri River on the New Blanchard Bridge. I can get you on the other side of a, a waist high concrete barrier with a semi barrel at seventy mile an hour, ten feet away from you. I can get you on any project in the state. I can get you on a highway asphalt crew standing next to all that hot hot asphalt when it's 100 degrees outside already and you're sweating at 120 and pretty much I think that'll tell the story that you're worth more than 1261 14 even $40 an hour it's hard work I apologize for running over my time Senator any questions go right ahead I don't think I have a question just a statement Thanks for the offer and the opportunity, Mr. McBride, but I retired on Halloween, and I don't want to be on any more highways or girders. Understood, Senator. It is tough work. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next, testify against. Anyone else to testify against? Just briefly. Uh, He's already took half your time, so it's got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> it will be good, and I'm one of those guys who makes his living with a pencil and a paper, and uh, unfortunately, so I know it's like, uh, I'm the, my name's Jim Paul, 
I'm an attorney representing the AFL-CIO and a registered lobbyist. We're in opposition to this bill for a number of the reasons that uh, Mr. McBride stated before. Um, additionally, as an attorney, I think my, my insight is that I don't do the same job every day. I don't work on the same file every day. And it's incumbent upon me to make sure what I charge my time to what file, what project I'm doing. And if I don't, I'm fired. Um, and I won't do it. For, so timekeeping and reporting is a system that we can all work on and all to make sure that a Missouri wage rather than a federal government wage uh, is paid for these jobs and that a Missouri wage that accurately reflects Missouri workers um, instead of a wage uh, from the federal government that takes into consideration non-trades, uh, the numbers here used would also be included with secretaries, dental assistants, a lot of other people that aren't involved with the trade. <coughs> and I think we can work towards an accurate reporting for an accurate trade for good Missouri jobs, raising Missouri families. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you. Anyone else testify against? Denise Ace, the AGC of St. Louis. And just briefly, um, with Senate Bill 68, we have the, the similar concerns to the previous uh, witness, and that is the collection of the data through the Bureau of Labor Statistics could include uh, non-construction wages. And in fact, um, I'm, I have inquired, but I don't have answers yet. I have inquired with the ABC of America's uh, chief economist to see if he can give us any insight as to how the BLS goes about collecting that data so that we might be able to better understand uh, how the bill actually would work. But that, that would be our major concern, would be that you have non-construction uh, wages mixed in. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Do your contractors have different job quali uh, classifications when they report? Would they have different crafts? Would they have? I believe so, yes, our generals would. Okay, thank you. I also, have, I also have a position paper that I'd like to define. Okay. okay, next, anyone else testify against? Seeing none, anyone testify for informational purposes only? None. That closes the hearing, and the vice chairman can come back. And I don't know where we're supposed to go from here. I hope you've got it all figured out. Opponents, but I think at some point 
uh, we need to have this discussion. I think there's 24 states now that are freedom to work, and one quarter of those 24 states border Missouri, and have been a continuous drain on job growth and pulling a lot of businesses uh, out of the state uh, across the border. And uh, so those are jobs that we lose uh, uh, probably forever if, if folks don't move. And uh, uh, you know, I think competition is a good thing. And this doesn't say that you can't be a member of a union. And it also says that uh, you don't have to be to be employed. And uh, uh, I, I look forward to a lively discussion. I've got to be gone for a little while to present another committee, but. Even back in uh, 1962, John Kennedy, by executive order, said that employees shall have, have and shall be protected in the exercise of the right freely and without fear of, of penalty or reprisal to form, join, and assist an employee organization or to refrain from any such activity. 1960. Uh, Senator, I think before we get into questions, uh, Senator Sater. Would you like to add to that? Or? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, I'm Senator David Davis here for the 29th District. And I would like to say, uh, Mr. Chairman, that this is not an anti-union bill. This is a pro-workers bill. And with the employment status as the way it is today, we want more jobs in the state of Missouri. And I think everybody does. Uh, Right-to-work states have added $1.7 million, million jobs to their payroll since 2001. During the same time, non-right-to-work states have lost over 2 million jobs from their payrolls. Uh, so this is about a jobs bill. This is about having more people with, with better pay and, and, and more jobs in the state of Missouri. So with that, that answers your questions. Thank you. Senator Brown, do you know what states have that order? You mentioned that. Do you know what they are? What states are? Uh, yes. Uh, I think all states ordering us. <coughs> Right, questions of the sponsors? Yes, Senator. One, Senator, housekeeping, and I'm new here. You all know that. Are these bills exactly alike? Yes. Okay, thanks. How, how many people here testify in support of this bill? Okay. How many in opposition? Okay. All right. We're going to do one four and one again. Against it. Again, I guess. So we're going to be four first. You got, uh, you got a timer there? Three minutes. And if you are going to testify and you have not filled out a witness form, uh, we can get them to you. If we know who you are. If you got one, you need to fill them out. All right. Hi, my name is uh, James Coyne. I'm the owner of Coyne Agency in Columbia, Missouri. And um, I also work with the Mid-Missouri Patriots. And we're a group that promotes individual liberty, uh, equal protection under the law, and constitutionally limited government. I have just two points to make. First, that the civil rights of every worker in Missouri has to be protected and that competition for membership makes any organization work for the real benefit of its members. Every worker in our state has the right as a free man to work wherever he wants. He has the right to negotiate with his employer for better wages or better working conditions. He can negotiate as an individual or as part of an organized group. He can join any group he feels promotes his interests and beliefs. But his right must also include the right to not join an organization that he does not believe in. Just as he has the right to contribute to an organization he supports, he must also have the choice to not contribute to an organization he does not support. These are among the most basic civil rights of a free man. A man should never be forced to join or contribute his money to an organization against his will. 
I have read the bill before us, and it does not infringe on the right of workers to organize and negotiate with their employer in any way. This bill does legally uphold the basic right of each individual to make their own choice on membership and contributions. My second point is an extension of the first. When you can choose to not belong to an organization, they have to earn your support. Earning your support means they have to do a better job promoting your well-being and listening to what causes you support and not giving your money to causes they support. A forced monopoly does not have to care about you. People seeking your support do. I urge each senator, regardless of party, to strongly support this bill and be a part of defending the basic rights of every worker in the great state of Missouri. Thank you for the testimony. Questions and witnesses? <laughs> Seeing none, thank you. Next witness in opposition. Get two at a time, Governor. Yeah, you don't mind. We'll be ready for you next when we come up. You'll be, you'll be next online. Again, my name is Emily Martin. I'm here on behalf of my company, Ashinger Electric Company, and the St. Louis chapter of the National Electrical Contractors Association, employers and employees. Um, been up here before on this issue as well, and there's there are a lot of questions. Does right to work create growth? I think you're going to find statistics on both sides of that issue, so I don't think we can qualifiedly say we're going to create more jobs in Missouri or we're going to lose them. Uh, where do we create these jobs? We already have, um, I believe that the private sector employees, only less than 10% of private sector employees are unionized. So we have already 90% of private sector employees um, already are non-union. So what additional opportunity are we going to have to create jobs and bring businesses into Missouri? That's already the climate we live in. How does right to work help? Well, it doesn't help existing unionized employers. I choose to partner with um, IBEW, in our case, for a number of reasons. One, I'm able to um, collectively uh, participate in a training program. Um, the contractors in our local, we all contribute to the Joint Apprenticeship and Training Committee. That way we can provide a very high level of both safety and trade training um, that benefits all of us as employers and benefits those 4,000 members of our local. How does it help existing open shop contractors? Right to Work doesn't help those existing open shop contractors. They already have um, that relationship with their employees. And how does it help a new employer? A new employer, in our case, we agree to a union security clause, which states that all of our employees must be members of that um, collective bargaining unit in order to be employed by my business. But that's an openly bargained term. A new employer who may decide to have union and non-union, they, they don't have to agree to that union security clause. That's openly bargained. So there, there's really not a benefit there. Where is the positive impact? The current law allows me as a business owner to make that decision. The prior gentleman testified that each man should have the opportunity to decide whether he wants to be a part of a um, bargaining unit and whether he want, where he wants to work. He should have the freedom. I should have that same freedom as a business owner. I should have the freedom to determine that I would like my employees to be part of a collective bargaining unit because it brings certain benefits to me as an employer and to them as an employee. And I should also be able to uh, make that decision as an employer that I don't want to. As an employer, if I have both union and non-union members in my same classification, I still have to apply those collectively bargained terms to both, um, both my union and my non-union employees. So where is the benefit? All right. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions of the witness? Saying none, thank you very much. Thank you. And next we are going to be in support. Get this mixed up before it's over up there too. Mr. Chairman, before I begin my testimony, I'll put my three minutes. 
I am charged with delivering the witness forms. I'd like to do that now. These are approximately 300 people in favor of these bills. And I have another stack of five that are opposed to the And to summarize for your edification, uh, these witnesses with the map. And I, I might also mention that uh, we emailed each member of the committee uh, a link, so you can go online and you can read the comments that, that these witnesses left on those forms. And you can sort the uh, you can sort the comments by district. So if you want to see just who in your district is, has left a comment, you can see that. Uh, my, now my testimony. For the, for the record, my name is Ron Calzone. I'm one of the directors of Missouri First. And, uh, and I am here to testify in support of both of these bills. And I just want to make two points. Uh, very seldom uh, do we hear any discussion talk about what put Missouri in this quandary. Because I think the last witness makes a pretty good point about the fact that sometimes you have an employer that wants to be a closed shop. They want to be a union shop. And uh, that's rare. Most of them want to, they want to have the choice to be an open shop. And sometimes we have workers that want to be members of the union, sometimes we have workers that don't. And the reason we're put in this quandary is because of a 1935 federal law called the Wagner Act. The Wagner Act has a sordid past. It was completely unconstitutional. The only reason it passed was because of something called the court packing plan. Uh, I have a, another handout that I'll leave with you that discusses that in some detail, gives you some history. And in fact, there's some, there's some other papers that give you the history of labor law in general in this handout. So I would suggest that you know, one of the things that you'll probably hear about today is something called the freeloader phenomenon. And that is, is when you have people that choose not to be members of a union, but they get represented by the union. Well, again, that's a problem with the quandary that the Wagner Act lives in. And I would suggest to the sponsor that if we're concerned about the freeloader problem, that we put a, a clause in the bill that just simply says that a union cannot be forced to represent someone that doesn't pay dues or isn't a member. And that should alleviate that, that concern about freeloader. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out, my second point, and if you don't mind looking at the map that I passed out, is that the Missouri Constitution already has right to work in, built into it. Uh, notice Article 1, Section 29. It's very short. It says that employees shall have the right to organize and to bargain collectively with the representatives of their own choosing. They get to choose whether or not to participate with a union or not. That's built into the Constitution. So these two bills simply put into statute, codify that is, what's already in the Constitution. And I think that we have an obligation to support and defend the Missouri Constitution. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions of the witness? Saying none, thank you for your testimony. Anyone next in opposition? Are you today? Today. Uh, uh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm about to sit or you're handicapped too. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Robert Soutier. I'm the president of the Greater St. Louis Labor Council, AFL CIO, representing over 100,000 union families on the eastern side of the state. I'll tell you, um, it's unconscionable to me to think that we have employer representatives here that want to say this is going to be good for workers. It certainly is not. I think the statistics alone will tell you if you look at the statistics, where wages and benefits are paid in right to work states versus the state of Missouri, you'll see a, a huge discrepancy. There's a reason why workers have the right to form, join, and assist unions. It's given to us by the federal government, upheld by our state, that we have the right to assist labor organizations. Labor is good for workers. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be under attack so much. The bill that's before us, the two bills that's before us, and one of the gentlemen said, uh, and it may have been the sponsor, that it forbids an employer from entering into a collective bargaining agreement with a union or a group of workers which states that you must belong to a particular organization in order to work. And that's true. That takes away the right of the employer. To me, uh, with the status that we're in in this country where we're looking, and the gentleman from the, I believe he said it was freedom or something, or patriot or whatever, 
uh, where we're looking for less government. To me, this seems like more government intervention into the lives of the workers in this state. If you just look at the statistics alone, the latest BLS statistics state that 11.3% of the people that get up every day and go to work belong to a labor organization. About half of those are represented in the public sector and about half are represented in the private sector. Now, I wasn't the greatest student in high school. However, if I take 11% from 100, I come up with 89. And that tells me that 89% of the workforce today is non-union. Where are their jobs? Where are the jobs for every kid that's going to college, getting out of college, coming out with a degree? He's not having to face a union out there that's so bad for him that he can't get a job or some employer that's going to require him to pay dues to some organization because of the collective bargaining process. I've been representing workers for over 35 years one way or another. I know the collective bargaining process in and out. No employer has ever been forced to do anything that they don't want to do. I'm telling you, Collective bargaining works. Unions are good for this state. They're good for the workers. We keep up the wages and benefits, and we should be having more unionized workers in this state and not less. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Any, any questions? Saying none. Thank you for your testimony. In support. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Bruce Hillis. I'm an advocate for free markets and constitutional governance. I live in Mexico, Missouri. I'm here speaking in favor of these four bills. First, let me just make a, just a real brief comment. Federal labor law is an equal opportunity violator of everybody's <coughs> rights. Under federal labor law, the Wagner Act and the Taft-Hartley Act, they violate the rights of the union, forcing them to negotiate on behalf of all the members of the, of the bargaining unit, whether they're members of the union or not. They violate the, uh, the rights of the worker, not letting him, as under Article 129 of Missouri's Constitution, to bargain for himself. They violate the rights of the employer. Now, there are some comments that he doesn't ever do anything he doesn't want to, but they force him to bargain in good faith with a, a collective bargaining unit once it's organized. He doesn't have the opportunity to go bargain with whom he wants. And they violate the rights of this state in the area of, of uh, statutory labor law by usurping from the state of Missouri the right to, to the opportunity or the power to, uh, to enact all this federal labor law. I would urge one little amendment to uh, the bill and that be that and that the bill would sunset when this state nullifies all federal labor law. Until you do that, you're going to have uh, conflicts between organized labor, employers, and and uh, employees. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions for the witness? Saying none. Thank you. Anyone in opposition? Thank you, Senator, members of the committee, Mike Lewis, uh, Secretary Treasurer, Missouri AFL CIO. Um, and lobbyists for the Missouri AFL-CIO. I'm here to testify against House Bill, or Senate Bill 76 and 134. As it's been stated, there is an undue burden put on an organized labor organization um, with this bill. Federal law, even though a lot of people argue this, states that a labor union must represent every single worker who is represented under a collective bargaining agreement whether they pay dues to the union or not. Now, I personally would like to belong to Gold's Gym and be able to go there and work out and not have to pay dues with everyone who does. Maybe I'd have the right to work out law. That, that, that'll work for me. But unfortunately, I'd have to pay the dues to have the same opportunity to do the same things that all other members do. The AFL-CIO, and I testified this exact testimony in the House uh, last week. And the 
people came in from Michigan to support this, this legislation. And they out and out lied, and, and you've heard from people who support this bill today say that it is the obligation of organized labor to support every member who belongs to a bargaining unit, whether they pay dues or not. Is this a Super Bowl? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, Trump. <laughs> no, I, I know there's other people who wish to testify, and there's a rumor that you guys are going back at 4 o'clock. So I'll conclude my testimony and be happy to answer any questions. Any questions of the witness? Saying none, thank you for your testimony. In support of these fines and bills. Just find support. 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 Both of them support. Okay. We'll let him go, and I'll have you next. Uh, my name is Mike Kilgus, and I'm a combat Vietnam veteran. I was over there every day except six, the first six in 1968, and I was there for the Tet Offensive. I flew 262 combat missions, and during that period of time, I spent a lot of my time holding the heads of guys who were dying telling them that they were going to live, and I had no option but to say, no, hang on, man, you're going to make it, you're going to make it. All I wanted to do was come home, get a job, get a home, raise a family, and just be happy. When I got home, I saw a lot of my brothers kill themselves because of the way they were being treated. And I watched it continue on until 1984 because the federal government would not step in and do anything about it or PTSD, Agent Orange, or anything else. So I went to Washington, D.C. to see what I could do to help change that. And I wound up working on the Hill from January 1st of 1984 through June of 1986. I was an independent lo uh, lobbyist activist, and I didn't get paid anything. I worked with congressmen and senators, not for them. While I was there, I saw things that made me so sick that when I left in 1986, I just walked away from everything. I couldn't believe that they were so corrupt. When I've seen the state of Missouri and the officials in the state of Missouri stand up and start fighting for what's right, help bring businesses back into the, the, into the state, like they've done in Texas and like they've done in Wisconsin, you guys really brought some hope back into my heart. I've run businesses. If I have limitations as to who I can hire and who I can't hire as to why or why not, if my taxes go up every year just because somebody needs a little extra money, and if I've got environmental laws coming down and, and jamming down on top of me, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to go somewhere else. And that's where our businesses have done, and they've left. And they need to come back. We need to provide jobs for everybody, and especially the guys that deserve it the most, the men and women that are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. They should be able to find a job in the state of Missouri and live here because they want to be here and not have to move to another state like Tex uh, Texas or Wisconsin because the jobs are there. So I'm asking you that you take this bill or these bills and take a vote on them and pass them. Because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be making the lives of a great many people in this state happy. You're going to allow them to build families. And I would appreciate it. Okay, thank, thank you for your testimony. Any questions with us? Saying that, we're going to hear one more testimony. If you did not get to testify today, if you want to leave a written testimony, you can fill out a form uh, when this is over, and we'll allow you to do that. Uh, but I'm sorry, we're going to be out of here at 3 o'clock, and so this is going to be the last one, and then we're going to finish up the committee. Hi, I'm Larry Redmond, Director of the Missouri Department of Labor and Industrial Relations, and I just wanted to testify that the administration opposes this legislation. Thank you. Thank you for the All right, that closes the hearing on Senator Bill. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Thank you, very quickly. Um, there, were some, there was some discussion earlier about reporting. Do you happen to know how many, um, uh, I, you may not know, of course, how many times specifically, but how often when reporting is done, uh, <coughs> that those 
reports have been reduced by the state by the department. You're, you're talking about prevailing wage reports? Yes. I do not have that information, but I'd be happy to uh, research it and get it back to you. That'd be great. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> okay, thank you for testimony. Any other questions? Say now. Um, one of the things for close informational purposes only. I apologize. We got one more. Or whoever's here for information. Is there anybody else for informational? My name is uh, Sam White. I'm a faculty member in the labor education program at the University of Missouri. I spent a lot of time uh, studying right to work as an academic issue and um, involved in some <coughs> research projects related to the issue. Um, and I have a handout. Um, I know you're camp for time here. Um, I won't go through all my testimony, but um, I would like to speak specifically about the difference between what I might call campaign material related to this issue and what the peer-reviewed academic material uh, suggests and also the readily available statistics that are out there. I think if you would consider them, uh, it would give you a much better understanding uh, of the issue. Uh, specifically related to economic development, uh, that research is very inconclusive. I believe that almost all scholarship on the issue Believes and points to the fact that it's the total package of business incentives uh, and other things that a state does to attract jobs that is the most important in terms of making the decision. Also, with respect to manufacturing, um, if you look at all of Missouri's neighbors, all of its peer states, both right to work and non right to work, you'll see that all these states have lost manufacturing jobs, right to work or non right to work. That really is a big issue. Uh, probably much larger than can be solved by any individual state in a piece of legislation. The last thing I would like to say very briefly is that there is a very strong link correlation between union density uh, and average uh, mean and median wages uh, in any state that you consider. Um, and the research that exists on right to work, um, the best research, the most recent, does suggest that uh, with passage of right to work within a 10 year period, you're looking at a loss of 9% union density. <coughs> the linkage is there. I would encourage you to look at the materials they gave you. You can see that if density declines, uh, average sure. wages, average wages decline, and that's union and non-union wages. All right, th thank you for your testimony. Any questions for the witness? I might remind everyone here, if you testify multiple times, you need to fill out a witness form each time you testify on that. That closes the hearing on Senate Bill 76 and 134. Thank, Thank you, Senator. You. Thank you. And that also closes the committee hearing on small business and insurance.